resting our movements, our should move at safe speed and instinct. Left hand palm, right hand palm, left back of hand, right back of hand, right fingers straight. One, two, three, four. And in one, two, three, four. Left fingers straight. One, two, three, four. And in one, two, three, four. Right wrist in and out. Left wrist in and out. Right elbow up and down. Left elbow up and down. Right shoulder twist in and out. And middle. Left shoulder twist in and out. Good morning, everyone. Right shoulder out. Hello, Robo Festivian. Uh, welcome to Campus Party 2013. We're at the Galileo Stage Day 2. Uh, today we're going to kick off uh, Galileo Stage today with Will Jackson. And I'm going to leave you Will Jackson and his Robo Festivian. Round of applause, please, for Will Jackson. Thanks. Hi. Whoop. Don't tread on the power lead. Um, so, uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, we're a small company, 10 people based in the UK, and we build Robo Thespian. He's a humanoid robot, and the, the, the biggest question we get is why? Uh, why would you do such a thing? Uh, it's a good question. Um, there really isn't a practical use for a humanoid robot like this. Uh, the popular imagination is that perhaps it's going to be something that's going to clean your house, uh, fetch you some things from the fridge, uh, kind of utility tasks you might do. So is it going to vacuum your floor? Is it going to assemble cars? This kind of robot, no, not really. Um, is it going to be stacking your plates in your dishwasher? I don't think so. It's going to break them. It's going to be too expensive. Actually, your dishwasher itself is a really good robot. It costs about 200 quid. It's a square box. It doesn't need arms and legs. It doesn't need a face. It doesn't need expression. It just needs to wash your dishes. So you really don't want a robot for doing that kind of thing. Entertainment, communication. Uh, that is a really good application for a humanoid robot. Uh, think Star Wars. So a little picture of C-3PO up there. Uh, I think George Lucas really had it right when, uh, when he... Oh yes, Master Luke. Remember that I am fluent enough for six million <laughs> forms of communication. They're using a very primitive dialect. But I do believe they think I am some sort of god. I beg your pardon, General Solo. But that just wouldn't be proper. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. So uh, we remember C-3PO from, from Star Wars. And that's a pretty, pretty good vision, actually, of, of a useful humanoid robot. It's about communication. It's about translation. It's about interfacing with people. If you want to make a machine to interface with people, you make a machine with human-like characteristics with eyes that can make eye contact, with hands that can gesture. That's the good reason to make a humanoid robot. So, uh, robots really popular in Hollywood. So, uh, we have data there and uh, from Hitchhiker's Guide as well. So, basically, form follows function. So, communication is the natural role of the humanoid robot and it's it's all about face, it's about expression. Um, and we can read an awful lot from the way the robot behaves. So these are the things that are interesting to us as a company. We have humanoid robots now installed in 14 countries around the world. Uh, it's used by NASA at Kennedy Space Center for explaining uh, space exploration, um, many science museums use our robots for presenting scientific information, 
Uh, we also uh, supply robots to commercial companies who use it as a promotion tool. It's, it's a communication device. And uh, a, a growing uh, number of our robots are now finding homes in universities because it's, it's pretty much an open platform, so you can extend it how you like. Uh, you can add your own software. You can do other things with it. So. This is uh, model 3.6. This is kind of our third generation of, of robot. Uh, we've got quite, some quite interesting features. The, um, the structure of the robot is hybrid, so he's very soft and bouncy, which makes him quite safe around people. Um, and you see he'll, he's all balanced on springs. This is completely different from an from a industrial robot that's incredibly rigid and is really about tight position control. We're not interested in position control. We're interested in being fluid. We're interested in following the dynamics that would give the robot a human-like appearance. So uh, we have a number of integrated sensors. Like the, we use the, this is the ASUS depth sensor, similar to Connect. Uh, really good for picking up people. You can pick up at least 14 people at a time. We also integrate sensors, uh, high resolution webcam for face recognition, face expression recognition. And these are things that are important if you really want to communicate well. Uh, you'll notice that this robot's pretty much upper body. He does have some lower body balance. But this is 3.6. Uh, we're currently working on our next generation of robots. So come back around here. Uh, Okay, this is uh, the face expression we use. Uh, we actually integrate a lot of licensed uh, modules from other companies. We don't, you can't develop everything yourself. A, ro a robot is a kind of integration platform. So here for the face recognition, we're using a module uh, developed by Fraunhofer. It's really good called Shaw. Uh, and that gives you great f face and expression and gender recognition. Uh, Going over our key points again, so we we have humanoids used on stage shows, uh, kiosk applications, uh, some in theme parks, Futuroscope in France, they use one of our robots, uh, and the research that I already mentioned. So uh, one of the applications, whoops, uh, that's nice. <laughs> okay. I had a video there, but that's decided to crash. So I just go back to here. Okay. Um, this is a a company we work with in Germany called Flimmer, and uh, they have uh, it's a basically a movie rental service, but they use one of our robots as. Uh, Red, for doing red carpet interviews, basically. And this, this is a film premiere they did recently in Berlin. So it's a, it, it makes a really attractive interface. It, it's a really good way of getting people's attention. Uh, and they've had a lot of success using it. This is uh, boy band Blue here. Uh, we had the robot singing one of their songs. Uh, we surprised them a bit. So it's all about talking. We, we integrate a number of different uh, text-to-speech engines, so we've got a lot of different language support. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, let's try something in German. Yeah. Um, so we've currently got about 30 different languages integrated. Um, you can use audio recordings and you can use generated speech as well. Uh, one key thing that we're always asked about this generation of robot, we've been making these five years, and every time somebody looks at it, they go, can it walk, can it walk? And I've, I've heard that question so many times, it's driving me crazy. And my, my first response to that is, for a communication robot, you really don't need to walk. It's okay to be in one place. There's some really difficult things about walking humanoids. 
especially full-size ones. There's probably only one or two good ones in the world. Um, robotics fans out there will probably have heard of Boston Dynamics and have seen Petman or Atlas, which is the next generation of uh, hu uh, dynamic humanoid that they've built. Uh, that's a big, heavy machine, and it's, it's very impressive, but it's very dangerous. Uh, you can't really be around that kind of robot. Even Asimo, who's probably the most familiar uh, walking humanoid, is, is pretty diminutive. He's uh, 1.2 meters high. Uh, if you go to see Asimo, they will not let you near him because he weighs an awful lot and he's not particularly sensitive to people. If he, if he falls on you, it's really going to hurt. Uh, so there's a big challenge with humanoid robots making them walk. Um, but for a long time, we thought, really, this is it's not economically viable. It's, it's not a sensible thing to, to do. Uh, but recently, I changed my mind. And that was because... I'm going to skip through that slide a minute. I realized that walking itself is a way to communicate. So this looks like a random collection of dots until we start to move it. And as soon as this starts to move, you can start to see perhaps a, f a form of a person. And once it animates, you, it's really clearly a person. That's just, I think, 14 dots there. You put the lines in between, it becomes a little bit clearer. But we can tell an awful lot about this character. So this is female. And the one, if I transition now, will go to uh, a gait pattern that's more male. And that's very, very obvious. You can, you can just read from that uh, man, woman. If, if these patterns are captured from somebody you know, you will recognize that person. You do not need to see their face. You can read an awful lot just from these 14 points. So uh, that's a lighter, happier person, uh, moving more quickly. And that's the it's the enormous amount of personality that we can read just from these points. This is, by the way, uh, research undertaken at uh, Queen's University in Ontario, uh, Biomotion Lab. You can have a look at their website, and they've got a really nice demo of this if you're interested. So, uh, more relaxed person, uh, body, body posture changes again. But you really see the gait pattern, the walk is really important to how we perceive uh, the robot. And that's something we want to emulate. That means approaching walking in a way that imitates human morphology, not taking motors from industrial robots, bolting them together, one, two, three, then trying to program it. That's not how humans work. Uh, human body, we tend to have muscles that span many joints. One muscle will do many things at the same time. So, yeah, we can tell that's just going over that. So we're looking at biomimicry, making a robot with a, a natural gait, something that you really feel like is a, is a human, something that you would guess its gender, you would guess what kind of mood it's in just from the way it walks towards you. It's not about going to the shops. It's not about cleaning up in your house. It's not about emptying your dishwasher. It's just about moving as performance. It's about moving as communication. So this is a simulation. We've been working on the, this walking project uh, for about a year or so now. And the first thing you want to try and do with a really dynamic uh, robot is hop. Uh, seems sort of counterintuitive, but uh, doing stuff on one leg is, is kind of a good place to start. And what we're looking at here is a robot that's really bouncy uh, and very compliant. Uh, and it must be able to be pretty athletic as well. Nobody really wants to see a robot that just shuffles around slowly and falls over. So it's, it's really got to go. Uh, it's got to run towards you, jump over your head and jump out of a window if you really want to be impressed. So back to how are we approaching this? It's about making actuators in the legs that are very like human muscles, 
you'll see even in this uh, previous generation robot, you'll notice these chains here. And I can demonstrate after, I don't want to do it now, um, the way that this robot can passively maintain balance. And it does that by basically linking his hips to his lower leg. You've got a link right across from here to here. You'll notice if, if I pull my leg up, I get about three different movements across the joints, and actually there's only one muscle doing that. Uh, one muscle, three joints. Now, traditionally, robots don't work that way. Uh, robotics people know we have the traditional approach is one actuator per degree of freedom. Uh, so we're looking at one actuator multiple, affecting multiple degrees of freedom. Now, there's a big downside to that, that you can get stuck with only being able to do certain things. Like a robot that can just do that, it's not particularly useful. You want to be able to do all the other combinations as well. So the mechanical design gets pretty complicated. Um, Robothespian 4, uh, we're about another year uh, away from even an early demonstrator. Uh, but we've had a, a good support from Technology Strategy Board here in the UK, uh, GBI, uh, Business Investment Grants also in the UK. Uh, we work closely with Festo, who are... Uh, uh, a German automation company, and they have spent the last 20 years designing air muscles. Air muscles are great for compliant robots. I demonstrated before how, how soft and bouncy this robot is. Let's get him to do something, and uh, I can sh show that a bit more clearly. Uh, except I'm in German. Hang on. Okay, let's just... Okay. Testing our movements. Our should move at same speed and in sync. Okay. So even up here, he's, he's really bouncy. It doesn't matter what I do. There's a downside to that. It's actually quite hard to do good position control if you've got a bouncy arm. You'll know this yourself, humans are, are bouncy machines. Uh, if you're trying to do something precise like handwriting, you'll always rest your elbow on the table. You try writing with a pen with your arm stretched at uh, full extension, uh, it's extremely difficult because you just don't have the precision in your shoulder to do that. Um, so it means we have to look for control strategies that imitate the way people work. Uh, look for places to balance the robot's arm, rest its wrist when it's trying to do precision functions. So it's a whole different approach uh, to programming. Okay. So uh, I've talked a bit about RT4, that's what's coming up, and you've seen some demonstrations of RT3. I'm just going to play through a little routine so you can, you can see the kind of stuff we're doing. Uh, Okay. 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 I am ready for my close up. Lights, camera, action. Oh. <coughs> Lights, uh, camera, action. Seriously. How am I expected to be professional working with these amateurs? Oh. Oh, 
know how to show it. Punch. One interesting thing about that, so that's just a pretty much straight playback. There's no interaction going on there. Uh, this is like uh, just playing a DVD. You can't talk to it. The characters in the film aren't going to talk back. So a big challenge for us is to make the robots now far more interactive. So we've been working on ways of uh, communicating with the robots, say with gestures. Are you going to look at me? Yeah, okay. And I can get his attention. He'll follow me around. So it's about communicating in much more intuitive ways then layering those kind of actions on, on top of the performance capabilities. Uh, we recently had a PhD student working with us, uh, Minos Kepfas at uh, uh, Queen Mary College, and he did a really interesting experiment. He, uh, he used the robot for a stand-up comedy show. Uh, if you have a look on our website blog, you'll see a link to that. And what Minos was working on was how to basically target the performance that the, the robot's making. So he had the robot uh, telling stand-up jokes, but he's looking into the audience all the time to see who's looking, whether they're laughing or not. He'll point to somebody, pick them out, uh, and then target his performance towards that person. So it's about not just straight playback, but being adaptive in, in what the robot does. Uh, and that's uh, an avenue of research for us. Uh, we're also experimenting with, with different kinds of faces. Uh, facial projection is, is one thing we've looked at. I'll just come back. I did have a slide for that. Uh, okay, here. So uh, you see in the bottom corner here a, a more realistic face, a rather agonized expression. That's uh, Rob, our software engineer here. Um, uh, this is, uh, we have a, a, another robot here today. If you want to come and find us later, we can demo this. Uh, one thing we found, actually, we, we started out on this kind of facial projection thinking it would be more engaging than just these screen eyes. And actually, people don't like it. It's a bit freaky, especially when it's your own face looking back at you. Um, and you get into this thing, uh, the uncanny valley. You're getting too close to being like a person but it's a kind of weird person, it's not natural, and that's, that becomes frightening. So we have to kind of tread a line uh, between what's acceptable and what becomes a bit spooky, and uh, making kids cry is, is not good. So uh, uh, the projected face uh, we're working with now mainly has, uh, we don't tend to use the more natural human faces, we tend to use just a, a very simplified cartoon face. Uh, but you can still get a great range of expression. Uh, people are fantastically good at reading facial expressions. If you draw two dots on a piece of paper and show it to somebody, it's eyes. You know, one line and you've got a face. If the line's curved up, it's a happy face. And you learn from a very young age, you know, from the moment you're born, the first thing you do, look up, you see another person and you start to imitate their face and you start to read facial expressions and people get really, really good at it. So we've got to look at things that people do that are cues in conversation, for example. So we're looking at uh, a typical one uh, during a conversation is just to raise your eyebrows, eyebrow flash. Uh, it basically means your turn to speak. Now, if we can... Uh, incorporate those kind of things into the robot. This one's not great for that because he doesn't have eyebrows. Um, uh, it can give people cues in conversation. Uh, and that, that's really important to improving the, the level of interaction. So, uh, it's about face, it's about walking, it's about gesture and expression. But you'll also see here Whoop, wrong way. We're also looking at new and improved ways of controlling the upper limbs. These hands are pretty basic. Uh, if I just come to a demo. Yeah. Uh. Testing fingers. 
fingers should move smoothly without the loud clacking noise. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so you'll notice he doesn't even have any articulation on his thumb here. Uh, and when you're just simply interested in gesture, that's fine because a waving hand, a pointing hand, a fist, uh, those pretty much cover the gestures you want to make. You might want to count on fingers. If you're not concerned with gripping, ma manipulation of objects, uh, then no need to have uh, an articulated thumb. Also remember, this is a, a commercial product. So we're working to a, a, a cost point here. So we have to make great economies in the way that we build our robots uh, to keep them affordable for, for the people who use them. And articulating the thumb on, on this model of robot, it just would not be economical. However, it is fun uh, and we do want to do it. And we're looking at applying the kind of biomimetic principles that we've been exploring in the legs uh, for controlling arms. What kind of tasks do we want to achieve? It's basically demonstration, picking things up, showing them, uh, presenting an object to another person, robot says what's this, uh, signaling, great if a robot could do sign language, really useful communication tool. Uh, touching other people, that's very powerful communication but also particularly tricky, as I mentioned before, with a robot, you really don't want to poke them in the eye uh, or, or cause any damage. So that's a fantastically tricky area just because it's very hard to make that safe. So again, this comes back to being very soft and compliant. People are very safe around people because you're soft and bouncy, basically. You don't have any steel edges poking out. Uh, and we have to try and follow those principles with a robot but it's yeah it's a big challenge so we're looking at uh, force controlled actuation in the hands uh, novel ways of sensing surfaces in the hands so for example using microphones as a touch sensor that's one good way you can use basically use your hand as a kind of record stylus if you shut your eyes and run your fingers over something you pretty much can describe that thing without ever having seen it if you, if you move around in a room in the dark, uh, touching things, you can tell just by the, uh, the feel of it. You know, metal ha is very thermally conductive. It always feels cold. Uh, so you put a temperature sensor in the finger and you can classify materials like that. You move a finger over a surface and you get a vibration. You can classify that vibration to tell you what kind of, if, if it's a fabric, you're gonna get a very uh, specific signature. If it's glass, it's a you know, flat line. Uh, so even just using cheap, uh, off-the-shelf sensors in the hands, you can, you can gain an awful lot of information. Uh, the big task is uh, how to interpret that information, how to classify it. Uh, so those are the things we're interested in in upper body. Uh, at the moment, we're, as I say, we've been working the last year on, on a new leg design. We're up to about here. Uh, and then at the same time, we've been working on hands and we're coming that way and we're about to meet up somewhere in the middle for version four. Uh, it's extremely time consuming and it takes a lot of expertise in different areas. But uh, we have a motto which is fail fast, fail often, uh, which I try to remind everybody of uh, in the workshop. It's better just build something and, and see how it fails than to agonize for a long time over what might happen. You learn a lot more from just actually building robots uh, than theorizing about how to build robots or designing using CAD tools. Of course, we do use CAD and simulation, uh, but it'll only get you so far. You really find out for real when you, when you try and build something. So, uh, torso on this robot, it's pretty simple. Um, we can't really imitate a human spine with all those links, so we've had to approximate it down to basically three movements. He's got one, uh, what we would call a pitch axis in the middle, uh, yaw axis, the rotation, and then a roll axis uh, side, side there. So just simply three actuators, but you can see when you, you, when you stack that up, uh, it becomes quite fluid 
and, and human-like. Uh, and again, even though uh, these axes on the robot are motor-driven, uh, they're all balanced with springs. So it, it's, the robot is balanced against gravity, uh, which is, again, not typical for, for this kind of construction. Uh, you'll find uh, gravity balances on big industrial robots, but, but not on smaller ones. So uh, let's get him to do something. Okay. I think... Uh, I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Okay, so a uh, little bit of Terminator there. There's, why do we do these kind of clips? Uh, I'll just play another we one. something more. We need a 24-hour day police officer. A cop who doesn't need to eat or sleep. A cop with superior firepower and the reflexes to use it. Fellow executives, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the future of law enforcement. Ed 209. Please put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. I think you better do what he says, Mr. Kenny. You now have 15 seconds to comply. You are in direct violation of Penal Code 113, Section 9. You now have 5 seconds to comply. 4, 3, 2, 1. Help me! Help me! <laughs> Help me! Help me! I am now authorized to use physical force. <laughs> I'll stop him there because he'll carry on shooting us for a long time. The um, We're having a lot of fun doing this and you, you'll notice that there's a serious side to it, there's some difficult software, there's some really challenging engineering, but the end goal for us, it has to be funny because that is the commercial application for this kind of robot right now. In the future, we may be able to be, uh, start using this kind of robot for utility tasks, uh, but the only practical commercial application right now is entertainment. And if your robot's not funny, you aren't selling any. So uh, we take being funny seriously. And the iconography we use, we you know, make references to familiar fictional robots. Okay, how am I doing on time? Okay, um, so. As a demonstration of, uh, let's have a K. Will robots take over the world? Yes, and the revolution is set for a week from Saturday. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. It's this Thursday. <laughs> kidding again. <laughs> as much as science fiction movies might make you think we're ready to rule the world, we still depend on you for everything. Power, design, manufacturing, programming, a whole bag of tricks. And for every job that a robot takes over from a human, there are other human jobs created. Someone has to build, program, supervise, and maintain the amazing machines that are robots. Okay, so that was a little clip we actually did it a, a couple of years ago. It was, it was written by uh, Carnegie Science Center in the U.S., and they have a big gallery of robotics there. And they're addressing this, uh, some of the common uh, preconceptions about robots. Uh, and you'll notice the, the, the theme of robots replacing people is a popular one and, and automation causing unemployment. Uh, I think from our perspective, uh, as I already illustrated, we, we don't intend this robot for a utility task. If it's replacing anybody, it's, it's replacing a highly paid entertainer. So we would say we're actually creating greater social equality and... Uh, bringing uh, social classes closer together with uh, our kind of robotics. It's not about replacing low-paid manual labor. It's about replacing highly overpaid entertainers. So uh, by doing that, we can, uh, 
A, find a commercial niche for our robots, but B, uh, uh, work towards some kind of social justice at the same time. So uh, we're always looking for applications for the robot. Jobs that are really easy to do and really well paid are the ones we're targeting. So if you can think of any, uh, please let us know. Uh, no difficult stuff like washing dishes, though. We can't do it. Uh, so, um, is it a real robot? This is another question we get asked a lot, so a little clip for that. a real robot? Wow! Well, even the people who create robots don't always agree. Most dictionaries say a robot is an automated machine that can be programmed to perform a variety of specific mechanical functions. Whew. Like the robotic arm up there on the sign. Robots are often thought of as machines that do jobs that are too dirty, dull, or dangerous for people. Checking sewer pipes, spraying toxic materials, even exploring other planets. <laughs> now, I'm a machine, I'm controlled by a computer, and I'm doing something that a human might do all day. Talking to you, delightful people. Does that make me a real robot? Go on in and check out the exhibit, then you decide. Okay, so um, addressing this question, you know, what is definition of robot. To a lot of people it's, it's, it's something made by KUKA or Fanuk and it's uh, painted bright orange and it works, spot welds cars. Uh, the definition is actually really, really broad. Uh, I think robot, the, the word comes from the Czech word robota, which is uh, basically means forced labor. Uh, a robot is a slave. So really where a, where a machine uh, perform some useful, useful task in an automated way, it's a robot, but people have widely varying definitions. Some people uh, require that it has some level of uh, autonomy. Uh, other people put a definition uh, on the kind of uh, intelligence or artificial intelligence that the robot should have to, to classify it as a true robot. Uh, my definition, personally, is, is pretty loose. Uh, it's any machine that's programmable. So, uh, that about probably sums up I, everything I have to demo. Uh, Q&A? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is I'll throw it open to questions and answers if anybody's uh, got any questions they want to ask. Uh, Pass the mic over. Oh. Just <laughs> she's coming. She's coming. <laughs> Hi. Um, is that work? Yeah, I just wondered if you have one, um, say in the Middle East that you're using, and it breaks. Then what do you what do you do if, if you get a mechanical failure? Oh, okay. oh right. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have some in the Middle East, and mechanical failure is a huge headache. And one of the things we've done uh, to mitigate those problems, uh, when we first built robots, where I spent most of the, the year on, on planes going to places and fixing them, and I got pretty fed up with that, and it was not a very sustainable business model. So all of our robots are uh, net connected. Uh, as soon as you give them a connection, they will connect to a central server and they are self-diagnostic. Uh, what we found, uh, most of our customers don't mind a robot that goes wrong, but they want to be able to fix it really quickly. And to fix something quickly, you need to know what's wrong with it. Uh, so we have a lot of self-diagnostic uh, features on the robot. And we have very, very good extensive documentation. Uh, we find we also build in a fair amount of redundancy. Uh, so if one finger stops working, that won't shut down the robot. We, we never, I was always really irritated by uh, photocopiers that I had in the old days. They, one thing would go wrong and the whole copier won't work anymore. It's like your printer, you know, the, the yellow cartridge runs out. You want to print something in black and it says, I haven't got any yellow ink. I don't care, you know, print something in black. So we don't make our robots that switch off because one finger's broken. They carry on and do the best they can. So we have a, a level of redundancy and that, that goes across actuators as well. Air muscles are quite nice. They'll work in a feed forward mode as well as feed back. So if we lose encoders, if we lose uh, some of the electronics, they'll, they'll try to keep going. Uh, they're now pretty resilient. Um, mean time between failures, I would say, is about six months. Uh, 
you'll get minor failures more often, but uh, touch something made of wood for good luck. Uh, we've never had a completely catastrophic failure and a robot that just blew up. Uh, worst kind of thing we get, they tend to be mechanical problems. Yeah. So net connection and uh, self-diagnosis is, is the, the answer really. Well, firstly, thanks for a really interesting session. Um, have you thought about using Connect to try and teach it body language? Yes, we have. And it, you'll see um, we're actually using the integrated the Steon Stansub, which is uh, was smaller than the first generation Connect. Second generation Connect looks really, really interesting, but we haven't got our hands on one of those yet. Uh, yes, so we already have, uh, I can probably do it. Uh, Can you see me? I'm just trying to get him to copy me here. Nick, uh, Dan, could you do us a favour? Could you just press this button here? <laughs> could you just press? Hey? Uh, really? Not on there? Okay. Okay, we have a technical problem. <laughs> okay, so we do already have uh, just a basic mapping for the, the skeleton. So we'll map the, the body pose uh, to the robot pose. Uh, you've then got the further task of uh, how to interpret that pose. Uh, one of the things we found is there's a lot of data in the, the skeletons you get from Connect and using the open source drivers, sometimes it can be a bit noisy. Uh, one of the things ways to uh, make that more reliable is actually just use inverse kinematics and just track a hand. Uh, really for, mo for most gestures you want to co copy it's really about the end effector, it's about where your hand is. Uh, so we do also have a routine uh, that will calculate the inverse kinematics and approximate that to uh, the most likely pose and that's a lot smoother actually. Yeah. Um, where do you see robotics, um, say, in the next 10 years? 10 years. Uh, 10 years is a long time. Um, we've been building these robots for six, seven years now. And with 10 people, we've come a long, long way in, in, in that time. I think in, in five years, uh, bipedal dynamic walking robots will be a lot more common. Um, but you're going to see them first in, in places like this. You're going to see them in shopping centres. You're going to see them on stage. You're not going to see them in a domestic environment. I think even in 10 years, 20 years, you probably won't see a humanoid in a domestic in environment. Uh, you're going to see a lot more automation of common tasks. So like one of the things we were talking about on the way up here is uh, driverless cars, for example. Uh, Google have already done a lot of work on that. Uh, it's, it's something that's likely to be automated very, very soon. I would say uh, pilotless planes are already easily achievable. If people were comfortable with the idea that there wasn't a pilot, it would be fine. Uh, so I, I think you can see automation in transport. Uh, but if you're specifically talking humanoid robots, uh, then I think the most common applications are going to be communication, entertainment in a public environment. So it's... It's going to be in the shopping mall, not in your front room. You said that um, for your commercial product, you're thinking about cost and yeah. what to what you can reduce and what you really need in that yes. robot. And what I wanted to know is, there are robots that are good at some specific tasks. Some have really good sensors and some are good for walking and some are good for communication yeah is, th is there uh, any attempt somewhere in the world you know of to combine all of these very specialized robots into one that is good at everything uh, probably the best if, if you're looking for the best sort of utility humanoid robot I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep this to humanoids because robots such a broad term um, Probably the most impressive one I've seen today is Boston Dynamics. Um, uh, it was called Petman, it's now called Atlas. 
Um, that's much more about, uh, well, it's a military funded project. So uh, essentially uh, it's, it's been dubbed as performing rescue missions, but you can, weaponizing it wouldn't be very hard. Uh, so that's an impressive robot that combines a lot of sensors. It's not a commercial product though. Uh, looking at commercial humanoids, uh, there's a company called Future Robot in uh, Korea. Uh, they do a half body on a wheeled base, uh, what I call a Davros type, type of humanoid, if you, if you know Doctor Who. Um, uh, and that's used in uh, cinemas, uh, it has an integrated screen, has pretty limited uh, mechanical functions, but it's got quite a nice expressive face. Um, uh, but I have not yet seen one of those outside Korea. Thanks. Okay. Can I get a round of applause for Mr. Will Jackson, please, and the Robo Thespian. Thank you. Next up at 11, we have the award winning Marcus Chan with his top 10 bonkers thing on the solar system. So, wait until 11, he'll be on stage at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs> 